Okay, so uh, we met the first time at the Cold Spring Harbor meeting on mechanisms of aging. And uh, me and Julia went there with a lot of data and had, I, if I remember correctly, we just realized that uh, our aging study is so good that we can uh, uh, publish the wild types only. I think uh, we realized that the, it had never been done in uh, hybrid mice in both females and males. Exactly. So we, just that we had hybrid mice, but also included both sex made um, this study um, like completely new by just yeah. using our wild type mice. And then like me having more of a biochemical background, we really need to discuss this with. And we were so happy to uh, uh, to meet you there, Jamie. And we had a nice discussion over our results and uh, decided to take you on as a collaborator, which we're yeah. very happy about. Yeah, me as well. That was really fantastic. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got to learn a lot about um, hybrid mice, which I had really had never thought about using before, uh, to be perfectly honest. Um, and especially learning about the body composition, which we're going to talk more about. Um, uh, it, it was really a fun experience. So thank you, both of you. Our pleasure, I'm sure. Yes. <laughs> but like, uh, uh, yeah, so that you mentioned, Julia, is that another aspect that makes this study so great is that we include both sex. Um, and I mean, yeah, we talked about this a little bit uh, before. Uh, like how this uh, it, the research uh, has changed so that it has been so uh, very focused on male mice and now to, um, starting to uh, uh, realize the importance of including females in the study, especially since, I mean, if, uh, women are many of the people that are taking the drugs that are developed. So using behavioral tests. Indeed. Yeah. I think a lot of things has changed in these past since we started the study. And nowadays there have been a lot of incentives to include both sex, which yeah. is a great thing. A problem is though that if you think about it, the tests that we use are predominantly have been done with male mice for a long yeah. time. And that includes uh, behavioral tests. So what was really uh, important with our study is that we follow these mice both behaviorally, but also physiologically. And yeah. I'm going to come into the mobility test. So, so we used um, to address a depressive like behavior. We used a common test called um, uh, the poor salt for swim test. And in this test, mice are placed in a water tank and then you re record how they move in the water. And um, both Molly and I had been taking yeah. uh, were joining swimming teams at the time and then you really get this feeling for that people have different floating capacities or they they act differently in water and since we had the data the physiological data from these mice we could see that the females had 15 percent at the highest more fat mass than the male mice and <laughs> as well because we were we were swimming and thinking about this thing and then we were yeah, I mean, I, I'm, if i could just interrupt because you were you were saying how when you were crawling that you had to really have a good speed and like um, uh, use your le legs a lot to keep floating while me having maybe a bit more floating material <laughs> did not have that problem at all so this is <laughs> <laughs> really talkative <laughs> of how uh, how we I had to, yeah. have come to this conclusion and uh, just thinking about like crawling and how you lie in the water where is mm -hmm. your floating it's yeah mm -hmm. and I think it so our, the, one of the greatest things with our studies that we actually included the body composition when we were doing the behavioral data and commonly it's only the body weight that differs yeah. and we Correct. did not see a difference in the body weight we saw that females and males weighed the same, uh, but they had differences in lean mass and in fat mass. And then when we were looking at this a little bit in detail, we could actually saw that how much the mice swam in water correlated to how much percentage fat mass they had. And this is also has never been shown before. And you haven't, like I haven't found a study where they actually address body composition and floating capacity. And since 
water tests are used uh, for several different behavioral uh, phenotypes. It's uh, it's very important in the study as well that you act uh, in, when you do water tests that you actually um, take into account differences in body weight if you're looking at obesity models. And in, as in our case, we found that there was a sex difference in water, but this sex difference could, we could directly um, uh, account for by let's see looking at the difference in the fat mass. So you, we cannot say, but there's a there's a a strong correlation between immobility or activity in, in water and body composition. So we found that 46% in the younger mice, 46% of the difference was caused directly by the differences in fat. So it's, uh, yeah, and I mean, that's, that's a lot. <laughs> when you think about it, it really is a lot because there's a lot of uh, behavior tests, um, as Yulia was mentioning. There's Morse water maze, which people classically use, um, which of course involves water and the ability to float and how much um, muscle mass, how much fat mass you have, um, really directly can affect your ability to perform that task. Also, the radial arm maze can be filled with water as well. And these are all commonly used co cognitive tests um, that researchers use. And I don't, I, again, I've never seen it published anywhere uh, where people are really thinking about how there are sex differences besides um, sort of the place cells and how you use your environment. People usually focus on that aspect of the test, not the actual physical aspects. Exactly. And I think I think that's a challenge that we will see more of now that both sexes are included in the studies, because we are so focused on measuring one thing, which is depressive like behavior in this case. And we don't think about, OK, so what are the other sex differences? Because we, you found a difference and that's super interesting. But can that actually be explained by something like in this case, physiological? And and that's why we can data can be very misinterpreted if we are if we don't know um, what kind of confounding effects due to other sex effects that is uh, is involved in or is interfering with our results. Uh, so I think it will be interesting to see and I think that our study was was early because we included females mice early but I think this kind of like six different perspective on and the secondary effects will be which will be even more common in the literature from now on. Mm. I would think so too and hopefully also I mean one of the reasons that we're doing this now is to spread this information so that people will know that there is this correlation. Mm. So um, but uh, I'd like to uh, go through a, a bit about this uh, reduced uh, uh, exploratory behavior as a conserved hallmark. So mm -hmm. um, one aspect of the study is that because we are euthanizing animals that are suffering from severe disease, we are looking specifically at aging and not features that come along with, it, with disease. So uh, I think this makes our results uh, uh, stronger also. And the fact that what we do see is a reduction in exploratory behavior, while we don't see any effect on uh, memory, for example, which we were surprised to see. Interestingly, we don't, we either, neither see an effect in bone density with aging. I mean, the old uh, uh, cohort that we're using, they are, they are not, um, so they're, they're at a stage where it's about 70% survival. So they started to die, but they are still, I mean, relatively healthy. And this was by choice that we chose this because we didn't want to have a selection on the cohort that we looked at. We didn't want to study the ones that um, were extremely long-lived only. We wanted to know more about the whole uh, population. I think I think you can explain it also because it's a difference between aging mice and dying mice. The, the lifespan and, and the new way to, to try to approach it, I think that's a really good point. Yeah, because usually you have a, yeah, you, you put an animal in an open field an aged animal, and if they have these other comorbidities, you're not sure if they are moving less because they actually are moving less 
you know, they have sarcopenia and these other issues, or maybe they have some arthritis or they're moving less because, wow, they're actually in pain because they have a disease. Yeah. yeah, and that and that's a challenge in the aging field because you wanna you wanna do research on old mice, but how right. do you do the dis discrepancy between dying mice and, and old mice? And yeah. I think one of the reasons why we actually that we used in our ethic in our uh, in our protocol as well is that we removed uh, disease, um, animals with diseases also helped us forming a cohorts of aging mice and not dying mice. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So basically, this method is about like uh, giving an estimate of like the so-called lifespan. I mean, traditionally, uh, lifespan experiments are conducted until um, the animals are or they are allowed to live for as long um, that they are uh, considered so sick from um, from disease, so that they could are not likely to survive for an, another week. And uh, that means that they could go for months or even years with big tumors. And uh, and that's, I mean, ethically, that's very problematic. But as we were talking about, it also can complicate other analysis, of course. But the way that we do this then is that we, uh, uh, um, when we euthanize these animals, we, have, we make two curves. One curve, we count these animals as if they, they had died from natural causes, causes, and that's of course is an underestimation. And then we make another curve that we cal we calculate these animals as if they uh, were as healthy as their litter mates, which they were not because they had a terminal illness. So we uh, we we then then that's an overestimation overestimation of the lifespan. So then we have a, uh, an interval that will um, be like the min and max of this lifespan. And we think this is a really good method that we hope people will start using in lifespan analysis. Yeah, I think it's really fantastic. Actually, the more and more I think about it, I, I know that maybe I'm biased, but um, <laughs> so many institutions are not allowing researchers for obvious reasons to perform lifespan studies uh, anymore because they do do not want the animals understandably so to be in pain and to be sick uh, mm -hmm. so this is actually a really nice way to say hey I'm, I'm doing a lifespan analysis however um, I'm going to euthanize the animals who are sick and still get data you know good solid data that I can use mm. so you and, can and have use one of these Yes. Yeah, yeah, and compared to other aging studies, because that was one of our issues, that we wanted to euthanize our, our animals uh, on, uh, upon early signs of disease. But since no other aging studies that we found had euthanized the same amount or the large percentage of mice, we knew that it would be different because, of course, they will have uh, a longer lifespan. But since we created this span, we could actually compare our data with it, even though we used a different protocol with with a lot of other aging studies in the fields, which is also important to to know the the platform and to also compare your research against what's known in the literature. Yeah, and to be able to uh, define the age status of your cohorts you're looking at. I mean, yeah, and this was initially in the paper that we submitted. I don't remember where now, but uh, uh, it was part of the reviewer's comments that the animals are probably not feeling so well because they have such a short lifespan. And that's when we started to to uh, think about this and to invent this method, basically. Yeah. Are we going to go back and talk about the exploratory behavior a little bit more? Because I'm sure. Mm -hmm. one one point that I, I wanted to also uh, mention was, I think that this is a really nice, easy way to, to monitor what's going on with the animals because there's no, um, uh, there's no cognitive testing involved in the sense that you don't have to worry, oh, I'm using males or females, so I can't, I, I shouldn't use this test for the females, I shouldn't use this test for the males, it, it's an, it's a conserved test that you can use for both males and females. It's easy in the sense that it requires not an absurd amount of equipment. 
and you put the animals there and then you you walk away and you let them stay in that environment for uh, um, an hour, hour and a half. And then you look at the first 10, 15 minutes of that exploratory time. And I think that's also something really nice that people, you know, I hope other researchers see and think how they could incorporate that measurement into their aging analysis of the animals. I think, yeah, and that's the easy, that, that is easy to, to do, uh, opens up for a lot of people to do it. But I think also one of the findings of this paper was that we found exploratory behavior to, de to decrease, but we didn't find learning and memory. And when you look at a lot of behavioral testing, they have an exploratory or exploration component in their tests. And since we found and could show that in a hybrid background, in both females and males, this declines. It is also, my question is like, is exploratory behavior and the decline in exploratory behavior a confounding effect of other results that has been shown of learning and memory because they are based on exploratory components as well. So I think yeah. also when you perform aging studies, you should actually assess the exploratory behavior to be able to know what your other behavioral tests show, since yeah. we have these components integrated into the test. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, we always try to do a light dark test uh, mm. beforehand, some yeah. sort of transition test to make sure that they are perceiving their environment correctly and that exactly. they move correctly, as well as the, the open field and other yeah. things. So yeah, yeah, I think that's a really good point to make that I hope other researchers who want to study aging more and other age-related diseases think about. And also to be cautious uh, about when you do a behavioral test and you have a test battery, it's preferable if you do the open field test early on when the mice are yeah. naive, because you can also see a change. If you do the open field test, we learned our lesson. If you do yeah. it later, you can actually change the order. So you want to have it early on in the in the behavioral test battery. And then also you can see, then you would know also if you find differences and you need to exclude results from from following um, from following analyses and, and tests. Yeah, and also that the animals are affected by ha being handled. So yes. their exploratory behavior will change. So then, it, yes. yeah. We know now it's uh, hard to compare them. Yeah. yeah. Mm. I had another comment on like uh, on this because this DEXA, I mean, this uh, DEXA equipment may not be standard in all laboratories it's, uh, for, for body mm. composition. The DEXA, so yeah. yeah, I don't think everyone knows. So DEXA yeah. is used oh, for uh, measuring the body composition of of mice and rodents. In this, can use different yeah. types. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And and uh, I mean, I don't know, maybe this is someone has done this, but I'm just thinking that one way instead to do this would be to analyze the density of the mouse. I mean, basically just putting them in water and see how much volume yeah. that goes out. And then that would be some kind of measure of what the mouse density is. Mm -hmm. While they're floating, they're not taking up. Yeah, maybe it's complicated. Yeah. <laughs> Mice float, they're known to float, and, and yeah. they don't do this themselves, but if they're not uh, naked mice, uh, they, they, do, exactly. they do float. And, and I was thinking, yeah, I think it would be uh, an excellent follow-up to actually look at, and I think it has been done at positioning. So I know yeah. that there's a, um, a, a paper out where they have uh, tried to remove the surfactant, so they added detergent into the water, and then they could see that the position of the mice changed so it has been shown that like the, the buoyancy, buoyancy. Floating, yeah. yeah but they, that has not been done in correlation to or in in behavioral tests so you can see that they do change their their position and their angle in the water but they haven't um correlated this to to anything as as what well, as the, what i know Okay, so the take-home messages from this work are that uh, we want you all to know that the main um, uh, conserved hallmark of aging behaviorally uh, is a decreased exploratory behavior. And we want you to be aware when you're doing water-based tests to uh, assay body composition because fat mass can correlate to uh, behavior in water-based tests. And also we 
want everyone using uh, or doing a lifespan analysis to think about um, uh, the ethics surrounding the lifespan analysis and also be aware that there is a method to calculate lifespan that uh, in which animals that suffer from um, severe disease or from pain can be euthanized and still give valuable data. And um, uh, I'd like to thank uh, the Swedish Foundation for Strategic Research, SSF, for funding Julia's PhD, uh, and also Jamie Ross and contributors to you. Um, and um, I think that's all we had, right? Thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Thank you. Okay, great.